IAS and astronomy, uh, getting, to, getting to know the department and having some time to think and engage in great conversations. Um, so I'm going to be, you know, I'm a geologist speaking, I think, to mainly physicists and uh, astronomers, but I'm going to be giving a whirlwind tour of Mars and the lessons that I think we can take away for the evolution of terrestrial type planets more generally. And, you know, as a planetary scientist, I sort of acutely appreciate the Apollo 8 image with the juxtaposition of the lifeless moon and this very complex uh, Earth with its lithosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere interacting such that it's been a teeming abode of life uh, for, for 4 billion years. Of course, as we move into the era of exoplanets, and this, is, this field is moving so quickly, my figure is now out of date. But as we push our detection of exoplanets, uh, let's see, use the pointer. Uh, as we, do, do you all see the cursor when I do this? Yeah, okay, I'll just do it on here. As we um, move our detection of exoplanets closer into those that are more like Earth, Venus, Mars, going down in planetary radius, um, pushing to uh, solar insulation fluxes that are perhaps in the area where surface liquid water can be habitable, we get these telescopic snapshots of what the worlds are like today. But really, to, to test our models of understanding these worlds, how they came to be, could they be habitats for life, we really need to test all of our physical chemical models over a long time, that is, over billions of years. And so far, there are only three planets I'm aware of that really let us test those models end to end over those long time periods, and those are ones in our solar systems with their accessible uh, geologic records. So, and of course, you know, key questions, right? Are the planets inhabited? What processes generate a habitat? And then what processes sustain or not uh, those habitats? So this talk is about Mars. And Mars, I think, is very special uh, in the solar system because of the time scale that, that you see here. Now, Mars uniquely has an insight into those sort of first uh, one to two billion years of its history. On Earth, we have a record from this time period, but it's been heavily deformed and metamorphosed by plate tectonics, and so is consequently debated often in terms of the content, and it's certainly incomplete. Mars, in contrast, uh, has about 50% of its rock record from this period, so it really lets us get insight into the period where the sun was presumably brightening, uh, impact bombardment was intense, and then uh, decayed. And, and so it, it really offers an opportunity to, to test our models of the evolution of a habitat and a habitable system. And in fact, we'll see that Mars uh, went from something probably like the image on the left here, a warm, wet world to the dry world we have today over that time period. So where this talk is going is I'm gonna give sort of the highlights, I guess, of the decade. <laughs> of the, the current discoveries on modern Mars and ancient Mars and update you on our understanding of kind of what the facts are for what is there now, um, how close is Mars to being habitable today, and what was it like in the past. So that's ideally the first 20, 25 minutes. And then I'm going to spend the remainder of the talk on some quantitative modeling that we're doing now using this rock record to trace the controls on the evolution of the system, including the fate of the water and what what atmospheric conditions made warm and Mars warm in the first place. Okay, so let's talk about Mars today. So Mars today, you know, at one AU uh, has an equilibrium temperature of about 210 Kelvin. So, you know, it requires 60 degrees of greenhouse warming to get it to be consistently uh, above the triple point of water. Like Earth, though, it has about a 24-hour day. Right now, it's tilted on its axis at about 25 degrees, so it has four seasons. It's more eccentric, so those seasons are a bit accentuated. The, the northern, the, the northern uh, summer is much warmer than the southern summer. But other than that, it's somewhat Earth-like. Of course, the solar flux being lower drives uh, that the temperature range that you see here, that coupled with the 96% uh, CO2 thin atmosphere, six millibar, so 0.6% of Earth's, means you know liquid water not stable. Uh, but you see here, Viking landing site that with a with a little canister that was detached during landing, uh, water frosts 
uh, on, on the surface coming and going. Now this image is from the Phoenix lander, which landed at about uh, 68 degrees north uh, a, a few years ago in 2007. And when its uh, rockets uh, fired as expected, it actually found thick slabs of water ice uh, just centimeters uh, beneath the surface. Now, uh, this is the video that's not playing, but that's fine. Uh, now, the surface that we see today at the equatorial regions where the Curiosity and the Perseverance rover are exploring is cold, dry, oxidative weathering, no ice nearby. But we are seeing hints of modern liquid water. I think one of the most striking uh, comes from the Spirit rover, actually, which as it was traversing over the soils, uh, just through some of the sandy soils, in fact, got kind of stuck at a point. And so it was spinning its wheels, trying to free itself as it headed toward the goal. And what it, what it turned up were the, um, this is a false color infrared image, but were the yellow, pink, white toned salts uh, that you see here. And in fact, these, if you look at the composition, depending on where you were in the traverse, sulfate salts, chloride salts, perchlorates. So that means in this uppermost sandy layer, sandy meaning relatively mobile, it probably hasn't been stationary for 4 billion years. In that relatively uh, thin upper layer, you see a concentration of salts, likely from some sort of action of liquid water to, to concentrate them as, as uh, that water uh, evaporated. Now, the other intriguing thing about modern Mars, and this is a mystery that is unsolved, uh, is, is that it, it's become clear that we're seeing hints of methane at the rover landing site, at the Curiosity rover landing site. So the, the typical concentration is, is less than about uh, 0.5 parts per billion, but it does have a seasonal cycle and occasionally that we're observing spikes uh, up to 20 uh, parts per billion uh, observed with a tunable laser spectrometer on, on the rover during the Martian night. During the Martian day, that signature goes away. So there is something, uh, some process happening that is generating methane, which gets excitement because methane is not at equilibrium in the Martian atmosphere. It has a lifetime of only hundreds of years. So the fact that we're seeing this variability on short time scales uh, is puzzling. Is it volcanic activity? Is it some sort of water rock reaction? Is it trapped methane from ages ago, trapped for some reason and now being released for some reason? Or is it an exotic photochemical process that we don't understand? These are all options on the table, but it's certainly a type of activity. Now, going back to the water part of this though, um, so what do I mean when I say liquid water is not stable? Well, I mean, it's not stable. Ephemerally, from a thermodynamic perspective, there are locations even on Mars today where uh, the, the temperature and pressure are such that for a certain number of days of the year, the surface does rise above the melting point of water. Now, water is, of course, not stable because the, the atmosphere is severely undersaturated with respect to water, meaning that water would evaporate. Nonetheless, you know, two, three weeks for certain parts, uh, it is stable. What is interesting, and we've started come to an understanding of starting in about 2011 and kind of continuing over the last 10 years um, was, was a result of this discovery in, in 2011 uh, by Roger Phillips et al, who sent a radar mission to sound uh, probe the depths of Mars with uh, radar. And what you see here is a map of the South Pole of Mars, which is mostly water ice. Everywhere you see the kind of the, the light color on this image, is consistent with water ice. Um, but you notice there are these uh, dark areas in the image, and these are areas of a different lower dielectric constant material. And what's most consistent with the radar modeling is that this is actually CO2 ice. So within the Southern Martian polar cap, sandwiched between these uh, small layers of water ice is an amount of CO2 that would basically double uh, the Martian atmosphere. How does it get there? Well, Mars has much more dramatic ice ages uh, effectively than Earth that are driven by obliquity uh, cycles. So Mars is not stable on its axis. It's, we are more or less observing at 25 
uh, degrees, not because it is the most common state, it is the state that Mars is in right now. Uh, Mars actually varies um, on its axial tilt uh, from about 10 to 60 degrees over billions of years. And over recent time where the modeling can be done directly, uh, it's from about 20 to 45 degrees. So we're looking at Mars actually at a somewhat low obliquity for Mars. And consequence of that is that at higher obliquities, that polar cap is exposed to more sunlight seasonally, meaning that these CO2 layers don't persist. They sublime into the atmosphere uh, at these higher obliquities when the polar regions receive more seasonal insulation. So effectively, the axis is controlling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere because it's getting trapped at the poles at high obliquity when Mars is straight up and down, and it's getting released into the atmosphere when Mars is at a tilt. So uh, very different than, than Earth's conditions, right? What, so, okay. What is the time scale for, for that release to happen? Um, once uh, you're at 60 degrees, does it happen in just a few it years? It happens or? in the course of, uh, you know, I'm not sure how high fidelity the modeling is, actually. It happens in the course of decades or so. It really actually depends on the thickness of the confining layer of the water, the specific thickness of the confining layer of the water ice. Because yeah, one season is not enough to sublime it, but if you cycle it through a few times, that water ice is removed. So it's a kind of the time scale, decades-ish to hundreds of years. But then the periods in between these trapping of layers are more on the order of um, hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So it's pretty quick once it starts happening. Right. Yeah. Okay. So to summarize our, our <laughs> kind of tour summary of modern Mars, so obliquity cycles vastly change Mars climate, increasing the atmospheric pressure, actually then increasing the amount of uh, the surface that is at least occasionally above the triple point. And this has effects on the Mars system that I think we're only beginning to appreciate and is a stark contrast to Earth's uh, relative uh, stability. Mars is close to being habitable now, certainly not near the surface, but the outstanding question is, okay, there's ice in the subsurface. Does it ever, with a geotherm, or, or perhaps volcanic activity uh, melt to become water. And so um, the big outstanding question is, do these water habitats exist in the subsurface and could they be inhabited? <clears throat> now, Mars certainly hosted ancient habitats and that's what I'm gonna talk about for the, the remainder of the talk, talking about first the nature of environments and then the conditions that sustain them. Quick question. So, yep. um, we say we don't understand Ice Age on Earth. Uh, at least that's the prevailing wisdom, it seems to be. Does comparative study with Mars makes us understand Earth's Ice Age any better? Yes, the question is about, I think, comparison of what we understand about Earth's Ice Ages versus Mars's and what triggers them. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's clearly a, a lot of value in the comparative planetology. We have a much richer record for Earth. And so think I think we better understand um, the processes, particularly that drive Earth into ice ages. It tends to be due to weathering, actually drawing CO2 down out of the atmosphere, uh, removing greenhouse gases. I think we less understand the other way, getting out of ice ages, whether it's related to vul volcanism or other um, effects. But uh, we have a very rich record where we can take ice cores, we have fossil records, and uh, our level of maturity of understanding is much greater. And I think the comparative planetology is great, right? Because if your physical chemical model is right for what's going on, you should be able to just change the constants to another planet and it works. <laughs> and if it doesn't, you've, le you've learned something. So I think there's certainly value in the, in the comparative uh, planetology. Thank you. Okay, so in the ancient past, why do we even know anything about the ancient past? Well, it's because we've had this, we've been in this really this golden age of Mars exploration that you can see here uh, with the missions of the 2000s, 2010s, and continuing on to the 2020s. Uh, we have a, a, a fleet of, I think it's uh, seven working orbiters and three 
no, four working landers uh, on Mars right now. And it's become a very international endeavor because not only is NASA there, ESA is there, China is there, United Arab Emirates is there, and India is there, all with operating missions, uh, returning data. So it's an exciting time to be a Mars scientist. And so the state of what we knew about outcrops, so I, maybe I should say first, uh, as I was introduced, I studied planetary surfaces and my particular specialty is the composition of planetary surfaces. So when I look at history, I tend to trace it through chemistry, minerals, composition, paired with geology. And this was the state of our knowledge of perhaps water formed minerals on Mars in, in 2003. The, the, and this global map of, of water formed minerals, there was only one location. We did land the Opportunity rover there. Um, but our current understanding um, is slightly out of date, but this map hasn't actually changed very much. There were three orbiters that happened after the Opportunity rover, and this is the state of the map right now. So it's worth spending a little time on what we're looking at here. So we're looking at a plain view map of Mars. I have grayed out the northernmost and southernmost latitudes because that's where ice comes and goes and it leaves behind these dust lines that obscure the surface. So you've got this modern big thick dust around that makes it not great <laughs> for making inferences about mineralogy. Um, but you notice that there, even within the mid to equatorial latitudes, there's some substantial heterogeneity <laughs> in where the minerals are. You see that the largest volcanoes, the, the four volcano Tharsis complex and then Elysium Mons, they're relatively free of, of water form minerals. That's because they're younger. <laughs> the uppermost surfaces of these complexes, um, their upper surfaces are probably between one and two billion years old, mostly a few much younger surfaces, 50 million years. Um, you also notice the blue dots. Those are something called phyllosilicates. They're hydrated silicate minerals, and they tend to occur everywhere that the terrain looks kind of rough. The terrain looks rough because it's heavily impact cratered. Heavily impact cratered means it's old. <laughs> so the, the blue stuff, the, the hydrosilicates, tend to occur on terrains that are ancient. And then there are various salts, chlorides, sulfates, carbonates, that you see have a bit more distinctive and spotty distributions. We don't actually 100% understand why, but it probably relates to local differences in water chemistry and environment. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But basically the minerals are in the oldest terrains, but they are heterogeneous. So now we're gonna do the rapid tour dive uh, into some of the environments that we see in the earliest portion of the rock record. And if you take nothing else away from this part of the discussion, I hope you take away that this early period was had geographically widespread and diverse environments, uh, much like Earth today, where the environment in Hawaii is not the same as Antarctica, is not the same as the Sahara, is not the same as what you'd find right here in Princeton, if you were to strip away all the vegetation and just consider uh, the environment uh, itself. So I'll start with the earliest and the evidence that um, some of the most early persistent environments that are preserved in the rock record are perhaps from water rock interactions in the subsurface uh, in aquifers. So what do those look like? Well, we're fortunate to have a few regions where we don't have to send an enormous drill to Mars to get at the subsurface. That uh, tectonic isostatic uh, readjustment of the crust has done the work for us. So there are these beautiful fracture systems that are uh, between 500 meters and a kilometer deep on the margins of the Isidus impact basin uh, formed uh, tectonically after the basin. And when we zoom in there and we look at the strata, so imagine that you know, you're know you like in the mesas of the Western US walking around and seeing this false color image of the landscape. What we see are volcanic minerals uh, without water, uh, like pyroxenes up at the top uh, the top of these plateaus, but the 500 meter depth uh, of these mesas is full of these uh, iron magnesium smectites, iron phyllosilicates. These are the hydrosilicates, and you can see that in the chemical formulas that they have incorporated water into their structure as H2O or OH from uh, interactions with what were initially uh, volcanic uh, materials. So this is characteristic of this part of Mars. And my cover slide is actually from a region very nearby where not only do we have these, these mesas full of phyllosilicates, but you can actually see um, these ridges uh, cross-cutting through them. 
What they probably are is ridges where minerals have precipitated, the conduits of fluid flow where minerals precipitated. And then as the landscape was eroded, these were left behind uh, as resistant ridges, but these are clay rich, uh, full of hydrated minerals. If we look at what impact craters are ejecting uh, from the surface, we can see that the ejecta from these craters are also uh, rich in various hydrous silicate phases. The details here are actually uh, not important unless you're an aqueous geochemist, in which case I'm happy to talk to you later. But some of the, in this particular instance, we see uh, the minerals chlorite and prenite, which uh, some of the minerals are great because they are fingerprints of particular temperature pressure conditions. They only form in very restricted phase space. And prenite is one of those minerals found in the ejecta of this impact crater. So this is a 50 kilometer crater excavating then um, uh, approximately five kilometers in depth. And this mineral that it's pulling up forms under temperatures of about 200 to 400 degrees Celsius, but, uh, and, and relatively though low uh, pressures of, of CO2. So pulling up hydrothermal minerals. Now we can do this all over Mars in those thousands of dots that I showed you um, on the overview image, looking at what's in the walls of impact craters, what's in their ejecta, uh, big and small. <clears throat> we see evidence for these various sorts of uh, hydrous, hydrous silicates. What, what, is the, like, what is the image you should have in your head as you see this? Well, one that I think is particularly pertinent, <laughs> who's been to Iceland? Yeah. So uh, if any of you have gone to particularly um, some of the fjords that slice through the basaltic lava flows of Iceland, you'll see terrains like this, stack upon stack of, you know, it's largely igneous rocks, olivine, pyroxene, these iron magnesium rich silicates. Um, but what's happened is that there's been abundant water flowing through them. And, the, and you, some of you may know that Iceland not only has, a, you know, it's a reasonably wet climate, it's probably quite similar to here in terms of annual precipitation. Um, but it also has a great aquifer system because these volcanic rocks are quite fractured. And so you have uh, waters and a great hydrothermal system uh, in them. And this hydrothermal system leads to mineralization. So my rock hammer is next to prenite chloride deposits uh, in Iceland and uh, boulders that have been altered to hydrosilicates. Now, if we look elsewhere across these same fractures, we see, we see other materials as well with different styles of alteration. Um, the details are perhaps not important here, but above our uh, clay-rich hydrosilicate bearing uh, thick basement of rocks, we have these more olivine-rich rocks. That means they're more magnesium and iron-rich. They've been sitting at the top of this plateau for a while, and they have been altered to contain carbonate, so meaning that they have likely reacted with the CO2 uh, in, in Mars's atmosphere. I just wanted to point out, I forgot the next slide is actually pointing out, some of you who are sitting in the front may notice not only the ridges that I highlighted earlier, but these little white blocks here uh, in the image that are indicated sometimes by black arrows. Those are actually giant pieces of mega breccia being thrown, thrown out by impacts over time that themselves have a geological uh, record within them. So our olivine carbonate, if we take a look at it, what does this look like up close? Well, it's this heavily fractured uh, veined terrain. What is the potential analog for what we should have our, in our head as we, we think about this, this particular terrain that we're seeing? Well, we see similar type features on Earth where uh, ultramafic rocks have been brought to our surface. So these are portions of Earth's mantle that have been uplifted by tectonics in, in our case. In Mars's case, the rocks are just generally more iron magnesium rich. What we see uh, here are, are these carbonate veins crisscrossing through the rocks from the interaction of water with the iron and magnesium uh, in those rocks to, to form these carbonates. And thereby, it actually draws down our atmosphere into the rock. In fact, some of you may be aware that the folks who are working on carbon sequestration, CO2 sequestration, are targeting these kinds of ultramafic rocks because they're, they're so effective in reacting uh, with CO2. So there are all kinds of proposals to pump down carbon dioxide in Iceland and Oman uh, in places like this for sequestration. Relevant to Mars? Maybe, in terms of what happened to its atmosphere. 
Okay, so that's what's kind of going on in the subsurface. Let's take a look at what's similar time period, what's going on with the lakes of Mars. Uh, everywhere you see a dot on this map is where my colleague Caleb uh, Fassett and Tim Gouge have uh, mapped out open and closed basin lakes. Uh, open basin lakes are like the one you see in the right corner here. They have an inlet and an outlet, meaning you can pin exactly what the water level was inflow outflow and closed basin lakes are what's shown uh, over there. Now we've been fortunate to send uh, a bunch of rovers to these and one is the, where, the, where the, um, the current rover is the, the 2020 Perseverance rover is just south of those first images that I was showing you of the clay and carbonate materials and in fact the watershed <clears throat> Of where that rover is now is, is eroding, slicing through those very mesas uh, and landforms that I showed you, transporting them uh, into the lake. And so it forms this beautiful deltaic landform um, that you may recognize as similar to the Mississippi River Delta from uh, channels flowing in, uh, depositing uh, various materials. Everywhere that you see green, it's a clay or carbonate mineral, and the purples and yellows are, are different types of alteration minerals identified through spectroscopy. And we see these beautiful uh, bedded, bedded layers from, from sediments uh, in different episodes flowing into the lake. Now, the, and, and that is what we're exploring now uh, with, with uh, perseverance, and I might have time at the end to say a few words about that. Happy to answer questions too. Um, the other thing that we see are closed basin lakes, and this is actually where we've been exploring uh, since 2012 with the Curiosity rover, Gale Crater, which is a 150 kilometer uh, impact crater in Mars, but that has this unusual mountain of sediments uh, in, in the center and probably at some time hosted a lake, although I wouldn't be so aggressive as this particular artist's impression to fill up the crater. So here's uh, Curiosity uh, on the surface where it started its exploration with the mountain of sediments uh, ahead of it. And what we've been doing is we've been climbing through this mineralogical record. So it's, 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 it's kind of like the Grand Canyon, except we're going up instead of down <laughs> through the rock layers. And you can see there's a progression uh, of sorts, although it's patchy. Um, from different units with sulfates through to those with uh, those hydrous silicates, phyllosilicate materials, through to those with iron, iron three oxides like hematite that are also hydrated, back up to sulfates again. So we, we're, we're really reading through a sequence of rocks that probably formed between about 3.6 and about uh, 3.6 and 2.5 billion years ago and uh, sampling them at very high resolution. And some of the things that we found um, are multiple episodes of lakes. Uh, so we see bedded lake sediments. We also see evidence for groundwaters coming through. These, these bright tone veins are minerals uh, deposited from groundwaters that came in after uh, the lake. And we see gas production in the surface uh, from rock reactions. And I'm going to talk more about that later. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it here. Curiosity has a, has a very sensitive uh, analytical facility aboard it. And, and we, we make measurements by drilling samples uh, into those rocks as we're climbing through every interval or where we see something interesting. <laughs> we uh, drill a sample, ingest that powder into the laboratories and do things like gas analysis of volatiles and gas analysis for organics. And one of the more interesting findings has been that we're starting to be able to determine what the organic inventory of Mars uh, is. So there are um, basically almost all of the samples have had uh, ringed compounds of, of some sort and a few have had uh, more complex uh, uh, structures and I'll refer you to papers by Jen Eigenbrod and colleagues for the details of the organic chemistry but it's starting to be exciting because we're getting enough detail that we can compare that to the meteorite record and understand how organics are being processed on Mars. No signs of life yet. But the other thing that we're seeing as we traverse these layers are changes in mineralogy. So Curiosity has an X-ray diffraction uh, instrument, which allows us to tell the crystal structure. And the details of the slide are unimportant, except that there's change. So where we, where we started out, um, there are a lot more at the bottom of this stack of rocks. There are a lot more volcanic formed minerals, but as we get to the top, 
uh, those are starting to go away and more things like iron three oxides are coming into the picture. But you can see it's not unilateral. There are iron two oxides transitioning to iron three oxides. So we're, we're starting to see these changes in chemistry. We can take certain sections and look at them in great detail and I'll be a geology nerd for a moment and take you through this. Uh, it's about um, 50 meters only of, of, of section. So, uh, you know, a little taller than this room, but uh, what we're starting to see as we moved into this area are greater amounts of calcium sulfate. So gypsum salts, uh, we started to see greater amounts of magnesium correlated with sulfate and greater amounts of, of chlorine. So what we think we're seeing are sulfates and chlorine salts precipitating in small ponds uh, in, 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 the, um, in the materials. And in fact, here we see mud cracks on the surface, just like you get mud cracks from drying waters. All right, and then there's more to come from Curiosity. Still going, and it's about to step into these different rocks that, that preserve uh, uh, sandstones and more wind-related features. Okay, the last large-scale liquid water bodies, and this will end our tour, are chlor chloride playas. And this is some actually re recent work out of, out of my group. Everywhere you see a white dot here is a place that chloride has been detected. By this, I mean sodium chloride in very large scale deposits uh, on the surface. They form in local topographic lows, kind of irregularly filling in depressions and are in a structure like this. They're draped over pre-existing older uh, clays, kind of filling things in the scale on this image. Uh, is about a kilometer and a half across bars cut off on the screen. So dry desert playas, this is the likely analog. What's been more interesting recently is that we've taken a close look and done a global inventory of all of these and used crater counting to attempt to constrain what is the age of the chloride. The age of the chloride is important because as you know, chloride uh, dissolves readily when it's in contact with liquid water. So these chloride deposits are actually the age of the last large scale liquid water on Mars are these deposits. So if you can find a place where they're on top of something that has enough craters that you can um, do, it, do an approximate age date, uh, you're in luck. And so in a few places, um, these chloride deposits are found uh, on top of lavas that have very clearly defined boundaries. So you can uh, do a cumulative crater frequency diagram, meaning count the diameter of the crater and its area. Um, and this is the technique used to date planetary surfaces with the, um, the inferred age uh, driven by the chronology that is calibrated for the moon and then extrapolated to Mars. And this gives an age of about 2.5 billion years, plus or minus a half a billion. So this is the age of the last surface waters, large scale on Mars. So as we conclude the tour through time, basically there's a period of subsurface alteration uh, throughout, and then these punctuated periods that lead to mineral formation, lakes, valley networks, extending about 2 billion years in time to something called the Amazonian period. So are you implying that the water appears and then disappears and appears and disappears? I, and implying that, that the surface liquid water is punctuated yeah. rather than continuously available, particularly as you go into, I, I apologize, I don't have the ages on this, this particular Noachian Hesperian boundary is about 3.7 billion years, Hesperian Amazonian is about 3 billion years. So um, as we move forward in time, the water availability is becoming more punctuated and just generally declining. Yeah, in terms of both the mineral evidence, as well as from my colleagues, the morphological evidence of, of rivers and lakes. Yeah, good question. Okay, now the last part I'm gonna talk about recent work. Where did the water actually go? All of this water, right? And what sustained the water in the first place? So, I mean, conventionally, the, the canonical answer is, well, Mars just froze over and lost its water to space. It was too small, so it didn't hold its atmosphere. Yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's the standard story. And what sustained the water in the first place? A thicker atmosphere, of course. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna examine this and whether this is in fact exactly what's happening. Because thanks to this golden age of Mars exploration, um, we now have you know, far more knowledge 
to be able to constrain geochemical cycles and the interactions between the atmosphere, the surface, and loss to space through meteorites analyzed in our labs that lets us get the isotopic composition of the atmosphere through analysis of mineral phases and gas inclusions through the suite of orbiters and rovers and their data sets. The MAVEN mission, which is focused on atmospheric escape and upper atmospheric processes, and then knowledge of, of isotopes collected by the, the Curiosity rover, Mars Science Laboratory at Yale. Sorry, that, but those are meteorites which come from Mars. But yes, and have come to Earth. Earth. Yes. Can you remind us how do you recognize a Martian? Two ways. The, it's the isotopic ratios and the gases in the in the in the inclusions. So the oxygen eighteen ratio is different uh, for Martian rocks versus uh, Earth rocks versus asteroids. That doesn't seal the deal until you look at also the gas inclusions. The noble gas fractions are different from the Martian atmosphere and match what has been measured on the surface and telescopically. Yep. Good question. All right, so where did the water go? Well, okay, it's not just freezing. Um, so if you, if you take the kind of the mineral evidence of water that I'm talking about, if you uh, look at the sizes of the lakes, the volumes of the rivers, um, the amount of water that it would take to form the mineral deposits, it's about the equivalent of 100 to 1,000 global equivalent layers of water. This is also the range that Earth is thought to have started with, more or less. That is, if you take a a meter layer and extend it all over the planet. <laughs> That's how we're measuring the global equivalent layer. It's how many meters uh, thickness. Today, if we you know, measure the volumes of all the ice deposits at the poles and in the subsurface, you only get to about between 20 and 40 meters. So some is missing. And you know, the question is, what is the path that Mars took in terms of its evolution of its water, available water reservoir? Well, one thing that also clearly happens is loss to space. And just as an isotope uh, reminder, so the fractionation factor is the ratio of the flux of deuterium to the flux of hydrogen over the ratio of uh, deuterium to hydrogen, uh, as shown here. And so the, the fractionation factor basically explains um, the, the sort of the, the preference or not for loss of deuterium. So if the fractionation factor is one, deuterium is lost equally well as hydrogen. Uh, if the fractionation factor is smaller, it means that there's a greater preference for loss of the light hydrogen isotope. This makes intuitive sense, presumably easier to strip away the less massive uh, ion. And so the, or, or atom. So the, uh, the fractionation factor for Mars I'm not going to go into the details because these are my atmospheric chemistry colleagues, but is, uh, is, is quite small. Therefore, loss of hydrogen is, is preferred. It depends on which loss process you like, what your fractionation factor is. But we know now from the record that we see both from uh, meteorites like ALH84001, rocks measured in situ by the SAM instrument on the Mars Science Laboratory, that as you go from ancient to modern, the, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen is increasing. So Mars's, atmos Mars's water reservoir is becoming heavily fractionated to heavier values. Now, okay, we've now measured the modern rates. And this is my colleague, Bruce Joukowsky at University of Colorado led the MAVEN mission, uh, which constrained the modern hydrogen loss rate measured it over multiple Mars years, Mars seasons. You can see the values here. And if you take that and extrapolate it out to about three, four billion years, uh, you get, you can explain two to 20 meters of water loss if you just, you know, assume that the present is the key to the past. Now, if you want to try to explain that 100 to 1,000, you need to in increase by an order of magnitude or two in terms of your loss rate. So now some of you might be more stellar physicists and magnetosphere people than I am, uh, but it's easy to understand how the sun was more uh, active, I think in the first half billion years, maybe a billion, but once you get to three billion years, it becomes, I think, hard to explain why the processes then should be so different than today, but I would love to talk about that more if, if uh, folks have insight. So prior models that have attempted to take this exchangeable reservoir 
that is the water available on the surface. Where it is exactly doesn't matter, but it is there. And it changes between the atmosphere, caps, near subsurface, maybe liquid when there's liquid. So this modern exchangeable available water, some of it is lost to space, but that fractionation factor. Volcanism, some people have included addition of volcanism in their models, but they can only accommodate so far these models, the lower end of the geological uh, estimates of water. What they're doing is they're basically doing a Rayleigh distillation where they take the uh, initial isotopic ratio, they, um, the initial reservoir amount is X sub zero, and then they fractionate uh, that reservoir over time by the fractionation factor computing what the past reservoir size must have been. And when you, when you do that, you can get to the lowest end of the geologic estimates. So is that the answer? Maybe, I mean, maybe Mars is at the lowest end of the geologic estimates, but I think there's another answer. And that is that the process that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, the hydrous mineral formation is actually critically important. That we, we think that if you, uh, I haven't, I didn't talk quantitative data when I was going through our environments, but, you know, to detect those hydrous minerals, they're there at at least 10%, five to 10% uh, in the rock record. And we know from rovers what the water, that the water content of a typical Martian rock is between uh, one and 5%. H2O, depending on the amount of water. So if you integrate that over all of the areas that we've mapped from orbit, uh, where there's water, there's a substantial sink that had so far been unaccounted for. And so um, recently my grad student and I, Eva Scheller, uh, modeled the effect of what does that mineral drawdown do to this process? Well, the water is actually removed comparatively with little fractionation. The factor is 0.95. So it almost uh, equally pulls down hydrogen as deuterium. And, and that's important because what that effectively does is by pulling it into the crust, um, the amount that's left to be lost space can therefore be more readily uh, fractionated and more readily lost because it's just a smaller volume that that process is then responsible for fractionating. So here's what's basically happening. So we start with our igneous minerals um, and under relatively low pressures of, of CO2, sometimes perhaps in the subsurface, we transform them to these the hydrous minerals that you see here, thereby sequestering that water uh, into the crust. It does not come back un unlike Earth. We, we don't subduct this crust back down and recycle it out through volcanoes. Mars does not have an active plate tectonics. So once that water is out of the exchangeable reservoir and into the crust, it's not going back into the climate system. Now, okay, what are the family of solutions that worked? We took a very different approach to modeling rather than picking our parameters and, and seeing what happened. We said, okay, let's take all of the parameters that everyone has extrapolated from the literature and see which solutions work to actually match these rich data sets that we have. So we have our, our reservoir model here. Our simulation constraints is that um, we require that the simulations all match the isotopic record recorded in two Martian meteorites from 4 billion years ago. We require that they all match the isotopic composition of D to H observed now, and that they also replicate the 20 to 40 meters global equivalent that we see here. But we varied many things, reservoir size, the amount of volcanic degassing, how quickly the atmosphere was escaping at different time periods. And what you do then <coughs> is we can function, you know, it's a million model run. Um, but here's one example, varying the effect of loss rate during this very confined period of time, uh, you know, 3.7 to 4 billion years. But holding all per other parameters constant, this actually proves to be rather important in the outcome uh, of the data. And you see some uh, fit the isotopic records recorded, um, measured in situ by the rovers, and the ends are measured by the meteorites. Others do not. If you do this for all of our parameters, you end up with a parameter space for what is the, the loss rate at Mars um, that is actually inclusive. It could include uh, the present day rates. Uh, more likely it's somewhere in the parameter space around the present day rates. But importantly, it doesn't demand the two orders of magnitude uh, increase in escape rates. It's permissive of only moderately uh, increased escape rates. If you look at the ratio of, let's take our maximum escape and member model, 
in our minimum atmospheric escape end member model, and you look at the relative proportions as to what the sinks of water were, how much was lost to the atmosphere versus how much was lost to the crust, it's actually a pretty interesting answer. <laughs> Under the maximum atmospheric escape rate, um, uh, somewhere around 60% of Mars is lost to the atmosphere, about 40% to the crust. And this model only occurs when you have voluminous volcanism pumping out water uh, over time into the atmosphere, you know, therefore you know, raising above 100% the initial. So under other cases where the atmospheric escape is low, you can actually explain almost all of the fractionation observed in the Mars atmosphere um, by simply drawing down uh, the water uh, into, into the crust with very little uh, contribution from, from uh, atmospheric escape. So our proposal is that in fact, Mars's climate change not necessarily because of the loss of thick early atmosphere greenhouse gases, but because it became more arid with time as Mars's chemical alteration that created these beautiful habitats for life for some periods of time actually sucked the water out of the climate, out of the active hydrosphere, into the crust, effectively never to, to return. Um, and this explains, reconciles some of the geologic estimates, the loss rate estimates, and, and the isotopes. It's a very different situation on Earth where we have continual cycling of our volatiles um, by plate tectonics, renewing our water supply. All right, I have about 12, oh, yeah. I have a question. You do not want volcanism to participate at all in perhaps perturbing the crust and returning some of that water or impacts and? Let's see, I wouldn't say I do either want it or don't want it. Um, it's that the mechanism for how volcanism would return water is less clear to me. So volcanism certainly creates more water in the atmosphere, right? Releases uh, more water, but I don't think there's a return once the minerals are hydrous, unless there's like large degree crustal foundering or, or something like that. Um, but, but as vol volcanism uh, brings material from the mantle through the crust and therefore I must modify some of the crust, Yes, so there is that there is this metasomatism uh, kind of effect that that um, can incorporate hydrous crustal materials that that can then release them. It's a fairly local effect in the grand scheme of things because it's only in the vicinity of the ascending magma. But but this does exist. You're you're, you're correct. All right, I'm. 11 minutes left, so I'm gonna answer the other question that you may have noticed I didn't answer. So I said, why did the climate change? Why did Mars become more arid? Why did the water go away? And well, the water got sucked into the crust. But I didn't answer, what sustained the water in the first place, right? There's this 60 degrees of greenhouse warming that we somehow uh, have to get. Well, the brief version of this is that it's not just a thicker CO2 atmosphere. We can do the exact same modeling exercise for CO2, isotopes, amount of carbonate in the crust that we did just did for water. And the answer is actually quite different. There is CO2 trapped in the crust. There was CO2 lost to space. But when you do this same exercise from the time period that goes from about 3.8 billion years, so after late heavy bombardment and, and before all the water related landforms I was talking about, <clears throat> you uh, do not get that much CO2. You maybe get a bar and a half. So, you know, thick, thick atmosphere, but not crazy thick. And, and anyway, it's been known for uh, multiple decades that when you get very thick CO2 atmospheres, which could generate warming, there are actually feedbacks with CO2 clouds uh, that likely uh, exert a cooling effect and limit that. Okay, so what are we stuck with? What's left? Uh, so what's shown here is a plot by my good colleague. I did not put the attribution. This is Wordsworth uh, 2016 and uh, an annual review paper with my colleague Robin Wordsworth at Harvard. And he's showing here uh, outwave, uh, long wave radiation is the bottom plot at 250K, which is a kind of higher surface temperature and 167K, kind of the bounds of Mars. And then he's showing the absorption coefficients of our candidate gases. So CO2 is here in blue and CO2 uh, is absorbing. So you can see the plots are sort of inverse, uh, less uh, outgoing long wave radiation where the CO2 is absorbing. 
uh, what is being shown here, the effect of other gases. H2O is a greenhouse gas or can be. Um, not so great in the actual temperature regime of Mars, but not terrible. Uh, CO2, SO2, H2S, all of these have been proposed uh, as greenhouse gases along with methane uh, and, and more recently than this plot, uh, hydrogen. And you can see the effect actually. So what he's, Robin is showing here in the blue line is the outgoing long wave radiation if it's CO2 only. But then if you actually do the physics, of including every single one of these minor species. Let's just do a make-believe atmosphere and throw them all in there in concentrations that have been proposed for Mars. Uh, actually, the collision-induced absorptions do have a significant effect by uh, lowering the um, outgoing long-wave radiation in the regions that are transparent to CO2. So these trace species may be important. And so this is kind of the frontier and I'll direct your attention to something you may or may not have noticed in the water rock reaction here. So this is not only a hydration reaction, taking anhydrous minerals and producing hydrous phases. Um, this is also an oxidation reaction where iron two uh, is transformed into iron two, uh, it's into iron three or iron two, three mixed valence phases like magnetite. So it's a hydration reaction and an oxidation reaction. And then what happens uh, is that the, the, the H from the water then uh, produces hydrogen gas in the reaction. So you're actually producing a potential greenhouse gas as you're altering uh, the, Martian, the Martian crust. And so as we you know, envision this Mars with surface water, subsurface water, all of these reactions occurring, could these silicate to phyllosilicate, silicate to hydrosilicate reactions actually be, be warming Mars by the projection of hydrogen? And then hydrogen itself can react with carbon dioxide to produce methane. So, you know, the numbers are not unreasonable. Uh, with collision, so there, if you assume uh, that the that 5% of the volume of Mars is undergoing this process at a rate that's pretty similar to the, the rate uh, on, on Earth uh, today, just 5% just of Mars. You could lower the late rate and do more area, right? But um, if you take these semi-plausible numbers and then pump that amount of gas into the atmosphere, and when you model this correctly, the radiative transfer using collision-induced absorptions, you can see the effect for different CO2 atmospheres. We'll just focus on the solid lines here in terms of for um, hydrogen and for methane, in terms of increasing the mean surface temperature. Now, it takes a lot to get all the way to 273, but you get, you get you know, several tens of degrees uh, by this process. And if you consider the effects of obliquity with ice coming and going, you can imagine a process where this happens in the subsurface, and then it's only episodically released. And then the climate flips back, it's you know cooking away in the subsurface, and then it's episodically released. So the frontier is uh, in a paper we published this year. Assume, just, just let's say this is happening. Maybe it's uh, a reduced gas flux from chemical reactions like I'm describing. Maybe volcanism has a different redox state. Maybe there are impactors. Um, but let's see, there is unfortunately, text that either got deleted or covered by a white box. But um, if you assume uh, a one bar CO2 atmosphere, that there's a uh, mean reducing gas input of shown here about 10 to the fourth moles per second, which is kind of a reasonable uh, rate for, for reaction of 5% of the surface. And then you assume that this is very variable in terms of how it gets released, like by a factor of a thousand is the difference between the max and the mean. What you do is you can set Mars into this funny state where you get different ox you get pulses of reducing gases and then oxidizing conditions and then pulses of reducing gases and then oxidizing conditions and the effect on surface temperature that it has is shown here. So you basically get these very brief intervals where portions of the surface approach uh, the, the freezing point. Uh, Robin is here collectively showing um, your cumulative time uh, above 273 Kelvin for different, for different pressures. So it's on the order of a few million years. So this is a new angle to the debate about Martian climate. Was it warm and wet continuously, like what we see on the left? Or maybe for most of the time, for 95% of its history, it was cold and icy 
with the water rock reaction underground with only these punctuated periods, uh, these punctuated wet episodes to create what the features that we see. The key samples are being collected now by 2020, which landed in this beautiful uh, Jezero crater. Uh, the rover is looking very happy here with its first sampled rocks. Um, and these are rocks that you know, have a, will have a spectacular record of volatiles being pulled down, trapped in the rock record, so we can increase the number of data points on our plot and actually test some of these models at high temporal resolution for what is happening to our volatiles uh, once these samples are back in Earth labs. So I will leave it here and say, you know, the longevity and continuity of the Martian rock record are really outstanding, I think, for us testing our understanding of various uh, processes, various climate processes to generate habitability. Mars was never exactly like Earth. It had a, a definitely a more, I think, a more punctuated history and, and different initial conditions. Um, and that it's understanding uh, these fine scale geochemical details that are gonna let us test uh, our understanding of the sustainability of habitability. So I will leave it there and take any more questions. Thanks. Well, thank you, Bethany, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we will alternate between in-person and on Zoom questions. Uh, please raise your hand uh, in the Zoom room if you have a question. I will start with Yes, Bethany, great talk, thanks. Um, where's the nitrogen? Mars, Earth's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. Mars, what has is CO2. Yeah, so I am actually not an expert in this question of, of where is the nitrogen and why does Earth have more? Um, I think part of the answer relates to the fact that Mars accreted with more volatile rich, more outer solar system uh, type compositions that were inherently more CO2 and, and water enriched relative to nitrogen. So its nitrogen budget may have always been lower. Uh, we do see nitrates uh, in, there is nitrogen in the Martian atmosphere on the order of a, I think it's, someone can, can fact check me quickly on this, but I think it's on the order of 2%-ish, um, but it's small, right? And we do also see nitrates in the Martian soil on the order of like one weight percent. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to your question right off the top of my head, but I suspect it relates to the initial uh, conditions and perhaps also to the redox chemistry in the mantle in terms of gas release. Don't know the answer to that one. All right, we'll move to Elliot on Zoom. Hi, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, in previous talks on Mars, I've heard a lot of discussion of the role of the Martian dynamo in protecting the atmosphere and the evolution of the dynamo as being important to understanding the evolution of water on Mars. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, so the question, the Martian magnetic field, was it there and was it important to the processes of atmospheric uh, escape? So I can answer the first question, was it, was it there? Uh, we see in, from, we don't, well, we don't have great knowledge of, of magnetics in Martian rocks because none of our surface missions have ever carried a magnetometer, much to the chagrin of my colleague Ben Weiss, who's been trying for about 20 years to get a magnetometer on a, on a mission. We do have orbital data and we have meteorite data. The older Martian meteorites do have magnetite grains that have remnant magnetism that suggest a field and then orbital data show that some of the very oldest terrains older than probably about 3.7 billion years uh, do have evidence for a strong magnetic field. There's a certain subgroup that have reprocessed that data and said even younger rocks have it up to about um, 3 billion years, you know, pushing the dynamo about a billion years almost later in history. We need better magnetics data and to do that, we need to um, either send a, an orbiter that has a lower periapsis uh, to get closer to the planet with a more modern magnetometer, um, or we need to send some uh, rover missions to get a better sense of when Mars had a magnetic field and exactly how strong it was. Um, in terms of whether or not it impacted uh, loss, some of you in the room or online may be more up on this field than I am, but the last time I reviewed this literature in 2016, I think there's something in the debate as to whether the magnetic field has a net protective effect versus a net loss effect. And it has to do with um, 
the coupling at the poles of the, the loss that larger swaths of atmosphere can apparently be scooped away in some, under certain circumstances with magnetic fields, but this is where I will have to send you to the literature because this is not my area of expertise. Thank you. These beautiful maps of the mineral composition on kind of on Mars, um, they're all made from hyperspectral imaging from remote sensing, right? So it's high rise. And that. How easy is it to actually identify these minerals? How many of them can be identified reliably? And uh, related to this, how is that different? How is hyperspectral imaging on Mars different from what one could do on Earth? Yeah, okay, how do I make these beautiful mineral maps? I didn't do methods uh, in this talk. So yeah, it, you're correct that it is infrared spectroscopy and typically infrared imaging spectroscopy. So every pixel has an associated image and Mars has data both in the near infrared, well, visible uh, out to the thermal infrared, uh, meaning about 50 micrometers uh, at various uh, spatial resolutions. You may have noticed that I wasn't frequently giving quantity from orbit, and I was frequently reporting single minerals as being present. Uh, that is because the it's an area I think of open theory is radiative transfer in compact particulate media is still something where our models don't work super well in terms of quantitatively being able to pull out abundance of phases and being able to recognize them all. And it has to do with the the non-uniqueness and the trade-offs between absorptivity and grain size and porosity in terms of duplicating the spectrum. So we're very good for detection of most phases at kind of a 5% level, some of them even lower. We're not seeing everything that's there. So you always have to make conclusions based on what you see rather than uh, what you don't see, unless you're directly comparing, well, I see this and I see this here. Yeah. So that's the, the subtlety. It's actually easier on Mars than Earth, though, because we don't have all this pesky water vapor in the atmosphere blocking out spectral regions. Next on Zoom, Bruce. Thank you very much for a great talk. In, in the 1970s and 1980s, Tommy Gold was arguing that some of the methane on the Earth was, in fact, primordial material that was just collected at the time, a formation trapped below the surface and released by geological processes. Is there any place for such a production or produ contribution to the atmospheric methane via a route like that on Mars? Okay, this is a question I've never thought of. Uh, could there be primordial methane still in the Martian crust? I'd say, I guess it's easier for Mars than Earth because once you cover it up, you're not gonna get disrupted by tectonics or, 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 or volcanism. Uh, that being said, I, I find it difficult uh, to envision truly primordial being dating from the time of formation uh, since the Martian crust has been you know, melted and formed a secondary crust. Um, I think though that it is certainly possible that you know, methane from earlier epochs, perhaps quite substantially earlier, has been trapped in ice or in clathrates uh, perhaps uh, beneath the subsurface and is being released, but probably not primordial. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just, you talked a lot about water and about hydrated uh, chemistry. Yeah. Is the focus on water just to answer the question about habitability or what's, is there another reason for the interest in water specifically? So I focused on water because I, I like the questions related to habitability and environments, and environmental creation. So that's why I focused on water. And also, the, I, I didn't talk in detail about the carbon dioxide study, but it had to do with it. So I am most interested in those gases that, that make things you know, habitable. So the water, the CO2, the hydrogen, the methane, how they're interacting. This is why I flubbed Jeremy's question on the nitrogen, because I haven't thought about it uh, recently. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to figure in a prominent way uh, into the, the cycle. It is certainly, though, important as a tracer of processes, as are the noble gases. So there's a very rich literature about xenon and argon and what this says about the history of loss rates. And those are very good for the heavier ones, very good for probing the early loss rates. So there's actually quite a bit out there that I did not cover in terms of the history of atmospheric loss and evolution. I see one more raised hand on Zoom. Hi. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. I have more of a beginner's question. 
that bears upon not only what you discussed today, but looking at exoplanet habitability. There are two types of things as you discussed in your talk. One of these long time scale geological things that you paid a great deal of attention to. The other are these cataclysmic events in which maybe because of uh, the exposure to the sun and so on and so forth, you could have solar storms and so on and so forth, which would be much shorter, but could have catastrophic consequences in blowing away the atmosphere. Now, as you point out, we know a lot about Mars, uh, in some ways more about Mars than we know about Earth. And uh, yet we are in this situation where we have two types of mechanisms, one on the short time scales, one on the very long time scales, but there doesn't seem to be a resolution in sight in terms of what types of things we should be focusing on. So just in terms of methodologies, I mean, how are we going to reconcile people who do studies uh, of the kind you referred to in one of your slides and the many geological studies to reconcile? What are the gaps so that we can come to an understanding of whether it was some cataclysmic event that blew over the atmosphere or whether it's a slow time scale accumulative matter in the manner in which you described Cried for uh, geology and so on and so forth. Yeah, sure. How do you reconcile these modern uh, measurements and much faster rates of process that are actually observable with the billions of year processes that I'm talking about? Uh, the answer is it's hard. <laughs> it's a combination of observations and models. So we should, certainly should continue to observe the modern system and to refine our models so that they work with, with the modern system. We're not quite there yet uh, for Mars, the global we, uh, meaning you know, the community of, of atmospheric and um, scientists and geologists. Um, in terms of how to make progress, in terms of reconciling it, so I, I agree, continued modern measurements. I think also this is where geology is important because you can actually go certain places and get, get certain high resolution records. If you go to a lake, an ancient lake, a three and a half billion year old lake bed, you will, and if you go and find the right rock section, you will still see annual layers. You know, just as you get on Earth, you get annual layers from you know sediment in, mineralization in during winter, summer, winter, summer. You can get those fine resolution time scales on Mars. The key is to get to the surface and find them. That kind of thing you're not going to do from orbit. You're only going to do by doing the type of work that geologists do here to pull out fine resolution records from ice cores. So if you go to the poles, you can get you know the last few to tens of millions of years at high resolution in polar layers. And, and if you explore enough, you'll find these special sections where you can get a high resolution from ancient periods as well. So I think that's the bridge, so, but it might be a few decades away uh, unless we figure out how to get more missions to the Martian surface at a lower price point <laughs> that's more affordable. Can I ask? All right, one last question, Shantu. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. And uh, so, uh, so from your presentation, it seems that Mars, we know that Mars has uh, lakes, but it seems that we are still not sure if Mars has uh, an ocean. Is that right? And I'm curious that if uh, Mars used to have an ocean, do we expect it to cover a large area of the surface, just like our Earth or not? Yeah, great question. Did Mars have oceans? Well, one interesting result. So I am not a great believer in the Martian ocean just because there's not a great deal of evidence for it. And one would think an enormous body of water when it evaporated would leave behind some better, more compelling evidence. But it's possible that the water was not very saline because it didn't interact for very long with the Martian crust. So there are ways to explain around this. So I think the question of whether there was a Martian ocean was open. I have to say it's one of these interesting things where one's work proves oneself sort of wrong because I, being a relative non-ocean believer due to lack of evidence, I was perfectly happy with these old assumptions <laughs> that didn't have enough water to permit there to be large oceans. But when we redid the modeling and you know to explain all of the data simultaneously, it actually does permit the kind of greater than 400 GEL uh, type type uh, volumes that are required to have a good sizable ocean. So the answer is maybe it's permitted, um, but there's not strong evidence for it. One more. Very briefly, you talked about these closed basins. Um, uh, is the water that came in there, is it coming from runoff or is it coming from precipitation? Do you mean runoff from snow? 
uh, from water that comes in but doesn't go out. Uh, okay, yeah, so the closed basins are certainly fed by a, a, a watershed, but it's very uh, localized. So a lot of them, you can see erosional features of channels uh, leading into the basin. So it's more than just direct precipitation into the basin. They do have, have uh, contributing watersheds that are, that are pulling in. So there's probably a contribution not only from uh, surface runoff, but also upwelling groundwater to support sort of a, uh, an aqu aquifer in a kind of classic hydraulic head if you're raining in the highlands and flowing into the basin, yeah. All right, we should wrap things up. Uh, so uh, if you still have questions, you are in luck. As I understand it, uh, Bethany will be around today at IES and has a pretty open schedule and then tomorrow at Princeton. So please sign up to meet and uh, let's thank our speaker once more.